Are you guys still rolling? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, we're, we're making, not revenue, I'm talking profit, a hundred dollars a day. I remember your excitement of like doing your own thing, not working for a big company anymore. I was still working for Apple though. Yes. Yeah. On leave. <laughs> right. You're listening to the Kniep and It Real Jodcast. This is your host, Seth Kniep. What's up, guys? Seth Kniep, Kniep and It Real. This is the Kniep and It Real podcast. Today I have a special guest on this show. She just so happens to be the most beautiful woman on the planet, and her name is KK. Hey, I'm <laughs> glad to be here. How's it going? Great. Good. Today we are talking about how a couple became multimillionaires by their 30s. And what's funny about it is we didn't actually start working on that until our 30s. And I don't even think our plan... Wait, which couple is it? Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out who that is. <laughs> we're talking about us today. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're talking about ourselves. We just, we just want to have a really cool um, down-to-earth conversation and talk about how we got there. Um, this isn't like our platform to boast about how great we are. We're, we have had plenty of problems along the way, but we just want to give people a very realistic inside look at what it's been like and some of the struggles, some of the questions people have asked us, like, how did you get there? How do you do that as a couple? Especially today when you see a lot of couples falling apart, getting divorced. And I'm, it makes me thankful, KK, that this sounds terrible, but that we don't make our marriage the main thing as far as to the world. Like, hey, look at our life as a couple. It doesn't mean we don't share, but I think that takes off a little pressure. Because yeah. I don't want to be like one of those couples where that's their main thing. And then they get divorced and it's just really sad. Yeah, for sure. I feel like how we're gifted and what our interests are, we run hard after those. and every now and then they just so happen to collide and we get to work together. Yeah. So I like that. <laughs> so this conversation, guys, um, we're just going to talk. We're just going to talk about what it's been like. One of the questions I was asking myself is how did we get to where we are today? What happened? And one thought KK that really hit me is when we were in therapy because we were struggling so much is I feel like it seems to me that when we started pursuing building a business, we decided we wanted to make more money. We were tired of always being broke. Mm -hmm. And because we were formerly in ministry, there was this sort of mindset that, well, that's just, you know, if you're in ministry or if you're a minister, you're always broke. It's kind of how it is, you know? So, I mean, we didn't believe this, but the mentality of sort of being the monk and you become poor and you sell all your possessions and give to the poor, where Jesus taught that in scripture, and obviously that was a unique example for a certain person whose money was his idol, so that's what he needed to do to get rid of his idol. But I still think it, it seeps into some religions, especially Christianity, and we just kind of accepted that that's normal to always be struggling, like that's how it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's supposed to be how it is. And we didn't wake up to that until we were actually in therapy because our marriage was falling apart. And I swear, I don't think my therapist ever said a single thing about go make money. But what happened? Like, I'm sitting here thinking, how did we get to where, as we began to heal, we started learning how to love each other better, started taking ownership for our crap. All of a sudden, we had this passion. Well, really more me than you at the first. Yeah, I feel like every stage kind of that we've gone through in our marriage has been really powerful and foundational to where we're at today yeah. even even the really hard times yeah so not that we don't we still have hard times but <laughs> i'm referring specifically to a few years in our marriage where we were both working through hang-ups in our lives and it just was really a struggle but if we hadn't gone through that if we hadn't had super hard financial stress in our marriage if we you know then that kind of laid the foundation for us to work hard yeah but working hard wasn't good enough and let me explain 
because tons of people work hard. Oh yeah. But they don't. They might still be in debt. They might just barely be making their bills. You have to work smarter, and I feel like that's kind of after we found recovery in our marriage, we started working smarter, and yeah. that was kind of a shift for us. And so, like, I feel like we. Yes, that applied to our finances, but it also applied in our marriage as well. Yeah, so. that's a really good point. I remember working for FedEx, no, for Kinko's, remember? Mm -hmm. When we lived in Southern California. Remember I took the night shift where I would work from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m.? That's And I was going long. to seminary school at the same time. <laughs> I hated it, that was so hard. I have great respect for every virtual assistant out there who works all night. Mm. We have staff on our team who do this, and I have great respect for them. It takes a long time to adjust to that, and they just work so hard with such a great attitude. Yeah. They don't have an entitlement attitude that a lot of Americans have. I love you Americans, but some of you suck. <laughs> I'm serious, some Americans suck. Their attitude, I just, I have no patience for it. Um, so, okay, so something I wanna share is, you know, a question I often ask is how do we get there? So first, number one, I never had a dream of being a multimillionaire. I didn't one day say, oh, I gotta be a millionaire. I, did, I wasn't one of those people. Nothing wrong with that. My dream was I was so sick of living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. I was so embarrassed when we would go to lunch and remember this, we would give them the debit card and they'd come back and say it was declined. And then I'd walk out to the broken up minivan, bring my checkbook, write a check, and then hope it didn't bounce. And you know, I think it's, would be easy to say, well, we weren't paid enough by our job, or, you know, economy sucks, or the government didn't help me enough. But anytime I let my mind go there, I noticed I would do less to make more money, hmm. not more. In other words, I would spend my energy complaining, inventing, not inventing, but and venting. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Though I have invented some cool stuff. And and it, it, it didn't help us at all. That's where I feel like the working smarter thing comes into play. Yeah. So, and, and back to the debit card thing not working. Oh, MG, I still get <laughs> PTSD at the grocery store, even though I know, I know, I know it's gonna go through and right. everything's gonna be okay. I right. still get that fear in my soul because so many times I had to leave my groceries and I walked crying out to my car. And there's a line of people behind you. Yes, and sometimes with little kids with me, like yeah. just really hard moments. It's, I like to remember those moments though because that's what keeps you humble. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, I wasn't planning on talking about Christian religious circles a lot, but I, this came to mind. In circles, in Christian circles, there's a lot of people who will say, well, you live by faith. I fully believe that. I believe everyone actually lives by faith. They believe that science will work. They believe that things evolved or that God created. Like they start with a presupposition that is unprovable. And that's a, that's reality. Everyone starts with a pre, they assume that, you know, what I see here on the table is brown. But that doesn't mean financial ignorance or stupidity, you know? Like my financial management was really bad. It was my fault. It was my fault that my debit card declined. It was my fault that checks bounced. It was my fault that I didn't present myself and work hard enough to make more so we could have more margin. That's my fault. Even if my employer is unfair to me, Hey, I live in a free country. That's what I love about America. I can't, it's harder to make excuses because I have the freedom to leave this job and go elsewhere and get paid more by doing a better job versus a communistic, socialistic society where it, there's this idea that everyone's supposed to receive the same. Talk about killing incentive. I mean, that's like death to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, as a father of four kids, I know that when one of the children, when they were young, they realize, hey, if they work harder, they get more. Wow, do they work harder? And they use their creativity and they enjoy life more. And they feel, feel fulfilled versus, I received the same amount as this person over here, even though I worked harder. Why would I work harder yeah. if we all get the same? So th I think that capitalism actually nurtures taking ownership. I was just gonna say, I love the ownership aspect. And I feel like a lot of times we, 
we have to get to that place of ownership and humility for more doors to open. Yeah. Because when you're in a <laughs> fixed mindset, you, there's no room to grow. Yeah. But as soon as you like take that step back and own your stuff and be like, okay, what, what is something different that I can do? Then you can move forward. Yeah. And so tell, tell me how you started doing that. And I say you because, well, we were talking this morning and uh, about, you know, the podcast, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to talk about. And you, I said, really, you're the only one that makes the money. And, but then you reminded me that you can't do what you do if I'm not supporting you and being yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and so I always think of myself as like your biggest cheerleader and yet like I'm the other half of the coin. Yes. And so I just want to touch- It's a nine, by the way, that coin's a nine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I just want to reiterate like how important it is for in, in a partnership or a marriage that one person might be making all the money or most of the money and that's okay. There's different roles that if you become comfortable and okay with how you're gifted and who you are when it, it's not reduced to just money, yeah. then you're free to love that person better and be there for that person. And so when you started working smarter, and I know we're gonna get to that, <laughs> Um, and harder too, but both. It really helped me to be like, okay, I'm okay that I'm not making all the big bucks in the family. And it helped me, it really freed me to pursue my passions more. Hmm. Uh, and I, I feel like I ultimately became a happier person through that. You Just, know why I think you're content with that, that you don't feel inferior? It's, let's be honest, you do make good money doing arbitrage selling on eBay, but you don't make as much money as I do if we were just to look at what we do. Right. But the cool thing is we see it as together. So we never have a conversation like, well, you make all the money, you don't. It's like, well, we do this together. Mm -hmm. But you know I think you're, why I think you're so content is because you know your value doesn't come based on how many dimes you are bringing in. Your value is not based on that. It's based on grace. It's based on God's love for you. It's based on your worth as a woman from the inside and out. Absolutely. And I think if the, if the world can hear this and say, wait, a woman's value is not based on how much she makes. All of a sudden, it's like, who cares if the man or the woman makes more? In some couples, the woman makes more than the man. Mm -hmm. But if they love each other and they have the same goal, Instead of it being a competition, it is a compliment. Yeah. They are different. It's a partnership. Yes, and they have different personalities and different strengths. Yeah. You know, and there, I loved you when you were dirt poor too. You so. know what? And that's so key <laughs> because you know how every day women are just coming after me because they want me because I'm so hot and everything, especially when You're I shave my hot. beard and I'm joking. <laughs> but <laughs> just it's so don't true. Shave the beard again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is so true. You loved me when I was broke. Mm hmm broke as a spoke. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just think it sounds cool. And you love me when I'm wealthy. And I know if we lost it all, you would still love me. And ditto. Thanks. And that's really cool. So I'll answer your question. Yeah. So how did I do it? How did we do it? For me, it started when I realized I had to change how I view money. My relationship with money was unhealthy. I viewed money either as if you make a lot of money, then it's gross. So that you're somehow gross greedy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very good. <laughs> hey, hey, getting some accounting terms in here. I love it. <laughs> or, or I looked at it as, you know, well, if I don't have a lot, then I must really be living by faith. There was some, a little bit of that in me. And when I say religiosity, I'm not talking about having a relationship with God. It, it, that is different. I'm talking about a set of prescribed rules that one adheres to and tries to follow in order to prove their worth because they think if they act good enough, they can achieve a certain amount of status to enter heaven or get some kind of heavenly rewards. I really think some of that was in me. I think the other issue was I didn't have a holistic approach to life. Like in some areas, I did work very hard. I've always worked hard since I was a kid. My parents made me pay for my braces. Thank you, Papa and Mama, for that. 
My parents made me pay for my first car. Thank you, Papa and Mama, for that. They made me do a lot of stuff on my own, and that was good for me. Mm -hmm. So I've always worked hard, but you're right. I didn't work smart, but I think the issue, the core issue was my relationship with money wasn't healthy. I somehow was afraid of having a lot of money versus saying, wait, if we want margin so we can do the things we love with the people we love and go to Costa Rica like we did and go to the beach or go to Miami and buy a beach house, you know, all these fun things we get to do. Well, money's a means to an end. It can give me the margin to do that. So are you saying that it, it boiled down to fear? I think so. Yeah, I think part of it was fear. And think a, about- You make a really good therapist. Can I get a couch to sit on? We ask you questions and you write in your notepad. <laughs> right behind us here. <laughs> no, sleep but if it. you think about that, that's so interesting. I've never caught that uh, from you before. Yeah. Fear is so immobilizing yeah. in so many ways. Oh, man. Look at our world <laughs> today yeah. and the, you know, the realities of COVID and all that. Yeah. And yeah, just to think like, how restrictive a belief is. Yeah. So the, I feel like the, the power of a positive mindset and, and really like laying out the goals and speaking them and seeing them and all the things, <laughs> how powerful that is when yeah. you really can start digesting all that. It, it squashes fear and then yeah. you can start moving forward and crushing your goals. Yeah, I was talking to Dan Rogers earlier today. And for those of you guys who may not know Dan Rogers, he helps teach the content for FBA Mastery where we teach Amazon sellers how to build businesses. And he said, Seth, I was listening to this old wise guy and he said, a lot of governments want you to be afraid because if you can get someone to be afraid, you can get them to do anything. Mm -hmm. Whether or not, we're not gonna get into it, but whether or not a mask actually helps you not get COVID, People will wear a mask because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And they'll be rude to someone because they're afraid. And all of a sudden, you can, it's sad, but it's kind of like marketing. I mean, marketing uses fear, fear of not getting something. Mm -hmm. But there's a legit way to do it and a non legit way to do it. There's a difference between telling the truth and, and lying. But they can use that. You can really use that to manipulate people. So, going back to answer your question, so the first thing that had to change was me. If I wanted to be successful on the outside, I first needed to prosper on the inside. I like it. Like prosperity starts inside you. It reminds me of that Toby Mac song, which is one of my favorites, where he's rapping with, um, who's the other guy from God's Property? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't remember. The cool black dude, and they he, rap together, yeah. and he's like, prosperity has to start inside of me. I think people miss that. People, they want the apple, but they're not willing to fertilize the freaking roots. Prosperity has to start on the inside. It does not start on the outside. Mm -hmm. And then people get into this, well, man, I gotta be perfect, and if I messed up, well, that means I won't succeed. That's not true. That's where grace comes in. Okay, back to the question. So, to how, question, how did, how did I do it? Yeah. So first I had to change, I had to change my perspective. Um, I got this idea that if I double a dime 20 times, well, it's true, it becomes over 100,000. It's like 104,000 in some sense. Like, wow, I could do this. And I remember the day when I was driving, I think I was on my way to Starbucks or something, but right here was coin and coins in the ashtray of our old beat up Honda Odyssey badass minivan. <laughs> Good old Betsy. Yep, and we even <laughs> named her. Like that van went forever. <laughs> and those Hondas were like, were like, yes. You remember living that way? We're like, oh shoot. Something's gonna go wrong. Hey, it has 130,000 miles on it. We're still going good. Okay, I this is great. I still have deep emotional attachment to that vehicle. Poor Betsy. We, <laughs> I loved we, her. We, what was she at? 400,000 miles at the end? It was insane. It was so it was, it many. It was over 300. So many sure. miles yeah. until it was pretty much the parts, you yeah. know. So I got this idea of doubling a dime. And around that time is when I just started going out and doubling it. What made you think of that? Like, where did I, that come from? I, I, I knew. It's such a great question. I knew this, KK. I knew that inside of me, I needed to learn to be faithful with a little amount of money. Because a lot of people said, well, why didn't you start with 20 bucks? Seth, I'm sure you could have pulled $20 out of the bank. I started with it because I needed to learn how to be faithful with little and focus on that. Like I would get home and I would post this on YouTube and hardly anyone watched it, no one cared. And like, wait, look, I have 40 cents. That's awesome. 
that's three doubles. Mm-hmm. Four times, but you start with 10 cents. You're that's three doubles. You're such a glass full kind of person. <laughs> I would have been like, wow, 40 cents. Well, let's be honest. You were not as impressed as I was. No, but... Did you think we were going to be a millionaire within like, it was like right around a year? <laughs> no, like I remember when you said, I'm going to pay off this house. And, oh, I remember this. And, you know, I definitely... I was born a pessimist, I feel like, but I feel like I have <laughs> so much grown <laughs> into totally the, the positivity realm. Yeah. But You know, hanging out around with a positive guy kind of rubs off on you after Absolutely. a while. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I just really had so many doubts. Like, yeah. how, how? I'm a very, like, show me, you know, the plan, and it has to make sense. But yeah. you were just like, I'm going to pay off this house. Do you remember what I did with the fridge? Refrigerator? Oh yeah, you made a chart. Yes. And you literally, it was like every thousand dollars or something, you would go and write the date down and and, and I would send the money. Surely. I would send the money to the mortgage company. So <laughs> yes. let me go back a little they bit. So, hated you so, so people much. listening, oh, I get they like resisted it. They said we can refinance. I'm like, no, 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 just let's pay it off. Let me let me go back so people have context. So. While I was doubling the dime, I, that's around that time is when I started the vape e-cigarette store. Mm-hmm. And the, the very beginnings of Amazon Journey. Yes, <laughs> and, and I, I, it did terrible. My biggest month was four hundred dollars. Now I don't want to be a pessimist either, but my goal was to grow that huge. But I ended up selling the entire company. Prepare yourself for thirty-five dollars on eBay, and it was good for me. Like, hey, I sold a company for money. Mm-hmm. Someone saw enough value to give me money for it. So like- See, Again, glass half full. <laughs> but it, it gave me hope. My first sale on Amazon, Absolutely. I thought if I can do it once, I can do it a million times. So I started that, that didn't, the e-cigarette company didn't go very well. Uh, started selling an eBay, it did okay. And then started selling an Amazon. And that's when it just started picking up. I think the, the part that really inspired me, KK, the most was when we started selling those cremation urns and we were getting up to 10 sales a day. Like I was like, oh my goodness, we're, we're making, not revenue, I'm talking profit, $100 a day. I remember your excitement of like doing your own thing, not working for a big company anymore. I was still working for Apple though. Yes. Yeah. On leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll right. talk about that. No, we totally can. <laughs> okay. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, first, it, I wasn't on leave. I was working. Then I went on leave. I leveraged all the leave I could so I could keep going. But you've always been an entrepreneur at heart. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Is, You're right. You know, you worked for Apple, but you were making badass money on your own, figuring out help. stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it was exciting. I was excited for you, and I was excited for us Remember and for the our cash family. <laughs> yes. That's when we got to 20000 a month. Yeah, that was, those were cool. Like yeah. we would have this huge box. I remember boxing it up and weighing it and everything and oh, yeah. sending it in. It was definitely a family affair. Effort. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Hearing the <laughs> tape, I just got so sick of that sound. So doing that, doing arbitrage, starting to find products through arbitrage. Like if it, I had this crazy idea, if you send in a few products and it sells within a week, one of them sells within a week, then it must be a good product. So private label that product. So we'd find a product, create our own version of it so it's private label and start selling that under one of our brands. Mm -hmm. And that just continued to grow and continued to grow. And then as that grew, we learned about Airbnb and started subleasing out condos and later learned about the hells of HOA, but for a <laughs> while it worked. toilet cleaning. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> we had up to seven condos going, so that was another cash flow income. Yeah. Um, and then... It's I, like it's like once you bit into that entrepreneurial it just, cake... It just went, yeah. You were like, I'm going to try all these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then from there, started doing coaching. People started asking for it, started doing it for free, started filling up my time. I remember one time I posted one screenshot of my sales in a Facebook group. And actually one of the people who saw that later became a student, became very successful, later became a coach for just one dime. But um, I, just, and just, I started getting all these requests on Facebook. Yeah. And so that's when I'm like, wait, we, I can't spend all my entire day doing one-to-one coaching. We have to create a scalable system. And that's when Josiah, who is my son, and he was 14, 15 at that time, mm-hmm. that's so weird. He was so young. We went to a coffee shop, stayed in that coffee shop, created a scalable system that 
coaches people how to build a business on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that's before there were a ton of gurus with all these, oh yeah, it's the next trendy thing, sell a course, sell a course, sell a course. Built our own course entirely from our own experience. It was messy, it was terrible camera, but we did it and it had great content. So I want to just kind of touch on what I was doing during this time yeah. because you were hustling yep. and I was hustling in my own ways. In fact, I, I kind of want to rewind just a, a little bit and say that like, while you've always been like the main breadwinner in our family, I've always had side hustles. Yeah. You know, um, remember when we sold Herbalife? <laughs> oh my goodness, I <laughs> forgot LA. about that in Los Angeles. Yes. And it's, it's oh, funny to yeah. think back on, like I've had, you know, a few, a handful of sales jobs in my lifetime. They're not my favorite. I've never considered myself like a salesperson. But then you when sold I- sold me when I met you. I, you're effing right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best sale of the century. Nice. <laughs> no, but I've always had side hustles and I felt important doing those things, even yeah. if it was just like a hundred dollars a month or, you know, whatever. Like I just felt like I was contributing or helping in some way. And, or even if it wasn't even making money, um, hustling, raising children or keeping the house clean so we can have like a stress free environment yeah. or, you know, there's so many ways that you can hustle and it, isn't necessarily making money, but it's still supporting and uh, being part of that partnership. Yeah. So I just want to touch on that one. When, when you started experimenting on Amazon eBay, I also started selling on eBay. I remember. And in fact, it's been like 10, 11 years and you're still now selling that on eBay. I, I started on how many, eBay. How many reviews do you have? How many start, how many, uh, yeah, reviews, oh, start I don't reviews. know, it's like. It's a huge number. 2800 it's it's not 2800 or something like that that's still pretty good yeah it's because i do it super part-time right um i would have a lot more but i do have 100 percent positive feedback thank you that's awesome good job <laughs> yes we, while you were dabbling in amazon ebay i also was hustling on the side selling on ebay yeah. um selling on facebook and also really diving into the fitness world and figuring mm. that new life out for me. Because Why did you choose fitness? I'm really curious. Could you talk a little bit about that, KK? Like what, what was it? What motivated you on a personal level? Sure. <laughs> so that is a whole nother topic, but <laughs> I'll, do the, the, to I'll do the short version. version. Yeah. yeah. So it came down to, I wasn't feeling good. Um, I wasn't feeling comfortable in my skin. I didn't like the KK I saw in the mirror. I didn't feel physically good. Yeah. And so uh, I saw a friend who had a really amazing fitness transformation and I was like, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> I want that. <laughs> and so um, she told me about this program that was through Beachbody and we had already been using Beachbody for years and years. Good old Tony Horton back in the days of P90X. Oh yeah, Abra for X. <laughs> Remember we make all these jokes about all these corny phrases he oh, would make? Oh, he had we're like, so many make some funny one-liners. Yeah, that... he's still my favorite trainer on there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Elise Joan, love he's, you too. He's a good Tony's entertainer, really good. that's for he sure. Is. <laughs> yep. um, and so I was like, you know, I've never committed to like a full program. Yeah. I'm gonna try it out and see what happens. And so I did 80 Day Obsession by Autumn Calabrese. And it completely changed my life. It taught me the discipline of doing a hard workout six days a week. Um, it taught me portion control, like how to have self-control with my uh, each meal, but knowing that I'm still getting like plenty of the calories that I need and everything, yeah. but just being educated. Yeah. So once I got the education, then I applied that to my fitness and my eating and my life has never been the same since. You know, I just thought of something. So we were talking about back in the days of our old minivan. And remember when I first wanted to drive for Lyft? Mm -hmm. So our oldest daughter, she went on Craigslist and was like, hey, just find some kind of part-time work I can do on the side. I, this was before I started doubling my dime. I think it was, it was before the, the vape e-cigarette business mm -hmm. as well. And she, so she found it and you were against it at first. 
Yeah, and we I had think it was tension. Uber first, wasn't it? No, it was Lyft. Okay. And Lyft was pretty new to Austin. They paid really well, and I was excited about it. I mean, I was kind of not excited because I didn't want to spend my, and this is back, still working full-time for Apple, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna do this as well. And, and as a manager at Apple on Sari, I mean, sometimes I had to do work on the weekends as well. Mm -hmm. Rarely did I do an eight, nine hour day. Most days were much longer. And I remember at first we had a little tension. And, and I think this is so important for people to hear. Codependency can absolutely kill a marriage. And, it, and, and a lot of people struggle with, what if one partner or spouse wants to pursue an opportunity and the other one doesn't? What do you do? Do you just do it anyways, regardless of what the other person thinks? Well, that's kind of selfish. Or do you never do anything until you get full permission? Well, that's kind of codependent. So how do you bounce that? And I think this is so hard for so many couples. Yeah. I mean, I still think in some ways it's, that's still a struggle. Like if we have a hard disagreement, like yeah. you think one thing and I think another, Yeah. you know, we just, we have a civil conversation about it. Sometimes we just like let it be and maybe even a few days later we come to a conclusion because we like take our emotions out of it. Yeah. But I remember how you you remember what you did when you were against it for a while. Yeah. But I really felt like I needed to do this. We talked. I did listen. I was like, what do you think? And I was like, I still feel like I need to do this. I've got to make more money. Yeah. Like we got to do this. But you were concerned because I'm going to be up till like two in the morning after a full day <laughs> driving a bunch of drunk college people around in our only car. Yeah. That was, that was hard for me. Yeah. For sure. But at the same time, like I did have like a little flicker of hope I could see your vision of like, it goes down to your why right yeah why did you want to do that um, nobody wants to drive drunk college students around right <laughs> but we had we had our van debt and we had credit card debt and you wanted to pay that off and start like a different life for us yeah but I'll never forget I have to just <laughs> Enjoy this for a moment. Tell the story. Okay. Their, their <laughs> method was if you're a Lyft driver and someone gets into the car with you, they would never do this today with COVID. Like, how dare you touch me? <laughs> you fist bump them. Oh, yeah. It's kind of cheesy, <laughs> but it was like the fist bump. Remember the pink mustache they would have you? I never oh put that gosh. on the front of the car. I was like, I'm not doing that. You should have. It's so cute. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. You but should I'll have just dyed your mustache pink. That would we have were, been great. We were waiting for me to be accepted because they have to do a background check and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had to look at all my records. I'm joking. But they had to do a background check. <laughs> and, and then I had to do a drive test with them as well in person, which I like that about them because they were more strict than Uber was. Mm -hmm. Uber pretty much take on anybody, make money. Lyft was a little more, you know, they had a higher standard. And I remember I walked into her bedroom, you were in the bathroom in front of the mirror. And I was like, I don't know how KK is going to respond to this. And I said, I got accepted. Do you remember what you did? I fist bumped you. You gave me a fist bump. <laughs> and I remember as I walked out, my heart was so happy for two reasons. One, I made a decision based on conviction. I didn't make a decision. I, I, I had to get away from the belief that loving your spouse means agreeing with everything they say. That's not true. You don't always agree with me. I don't always agree with you. Mm -hmm. But we always have to work together to find a healthy compromise that works. Number one, that was, and that was hard for me. And I think a lot of couples struggle with this because the emotional insecurity one feels doing something without, it wasn't that you didn't support me, but the full agreement of the spouse is kind of hard, especially when you love that person. Yeah. Honestly, going back to the fear thing, I had my own fears that I was struggling with that I had to just like trust God and let go. Yeah. And once I did that, it was so much easier to one, see the vision that you had in place and two, to just like be like, this is, it's fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. It was more than fine, in fact. I mean, I remember the first week we made over $400, and to me that was a ton of money. I was blown away, like, yes. oh man, yeah. like this is, this is awesome. But that didn't compare to Amazon at all. But I used that, those late nights driving, to pay off our car. So that way we reduced our debt. And Dave Ramsey had a huge impact on our life. And it's funny, you know, I respect Dave Ramsey very much. Mm -hmm. He doesn't influence me today like he used to. Now it's Robert Kiyosaki. But if I jumped straight to Robert Kiyosaki, it, it, would have, it, it wouldn't have worked. Baby, I would, baby steps. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like, what about Bob? Like, it really wouldn't have worked because he's so advanced and there's so much about borrowing. And 
I had a problem managing money. We were in debt. We had credit card debt. I needed to learn how to get rid of that and discipline ourselves on a budget before I was ready mm -hmm. to take investments with some calculated risks and understand healthy debt and how to leverage that. So like it, it just, it's been such a transformation. Yeah. So how then do you feel like you moved from, like we paid off our van by you doing Uber and Lyft, then we paid off our credit card debt. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to my then dream house. Yes. Oh yeah, <laughs> blindfolded you. Yep. But how, how did you eventually work smarter? Because yeah. you, you definitely worked harder. Yeah. But working smarter, I feel like is... So key. Yes. Yeah, Amazon private label. Because when you have products there in Amazon's fulfillment center, they sell for you. Yep. I didn't have to be packaging everything. Because we did a lot of arbitrage where you buy stuff at Walmart or yeah. wherever, Kroger's, and we go resell. But you liked that more. Mm -hmm. My mind was more, I don't love the resell. I want the money so we can have margin. I want to freaking pay off our house. Yeah. Like that was so far reaching and unbelievable to me at that time. So it's Amazon private label. Like that was working smarter because I focused more on creating beautiful listings that people want to buy that convert high. I don't have to be the one fulfilling every order. I don't have to be the one handling the customer service. And the same thing with just when I'm coaching, same thing. Even though I would do a lot of the group coaching, I didn't have to coach every single person. We actually created videos that people could watch at any time. I didn't have to be there for them to watch the videos. We mm -hmm. just had to make sure they're updated. And then that's when we started hiring other coaches to scale. And so now we have So having your money work for you yes. versus you working for your money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention, and, and I was thinking about this earlier, I think what really has helped us, and I say that, you know, understanding we've received a lot of grace in our life too. We, when we first met, we wanted to build our own identity as a couple and then later as a family. And I believe a lot of good intention couples and families are so connected and enmeshed, mm -hmm. unhealthily enmeshed mm -hmm. with their parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts, their nephews, their siblings, that they measure their level of success based on what everyone around them is saying. Even with their clothes, and I'll, I'll give a perfect example of this. I won't mention his name, I'll call him William. One of our students, William, I don't really teach on losing weight, I know you do, but just from the motivation that we teach and provide, and back then he was just following me, he lost a ton of weight. He was obese, he lost it, he stopped drinking. And one of his close friends, it was either a family member or like I think his wife's brother or something said, I miss the old William. Mm. And he goes, I don't miss him. And I thought, wow, why would his, one of his closest friends want him to be an alcoholic? Because it probably made his friend more comfortable that he was at his level. It yeah. probably irritates him. It stirs up something in their own conviction. life, in their heart yeah. that doesn't settle. <laughs> yeah. That actually happened to me I don't know if you remember, and I won't say which family member, Sure. <laughs> but it was a family member, when we, in the beginning of our relationship, and uh, back then, I started working out more and, you know, getting more into health back then as yeah. well. Um, and I remember we were at a dinner with some family members, and I re refused to put butter on my bread or something that I was having. I just... I wasn't making a big deal about it. I was just like, no, I don't want that. Yeah. And this person said to me, why aren't you eating the butter? Hmm. Like, <laughs> like with a judgmental tone. It yes. wasn't just like an innocent, hey, do you want some butter? It was more, why aren't you? Yeah. What's wrong? Exactly. Yeah. And just a lot of judgment yeah. <laughs> vibes from that person. And, you know, if, with those kind of situations, those are toxic situations, toxic yep. people sometimes. And you have to get yourself out of there and do what's best for yourself yeah. and, and your family. And if the only people that I'm around are close friends and family that live to a standard that I don't want, I'm still going to be influenced by that. It doesn't mean they have to become enemies. It doesn't mean we don't talk to them anymore, but it means we have to have our own identity. And I think you and me moving from Northern California, <laughs> three months after we were married, all the way to Los Angeles, yep. although I didn't have a job at that time, we figured it out. <laughs> was still a smart move because it helped us to build our own identity. And it's therefore a we fresh felt- environment. Yeah, we so, felt free to go try stuff that 
Creativity. Our family wouldn't even think about, exactly. or they would think it's weird. To, I've heard so many people, KK, say, "Man, you sell on Amazon? Like, am I really supposed to believe this is legit?" I, there are some people who they'll show their sales, and they still question, "Does this is this even normal?" Mm -hmm. A lot of people in the world don't understand you can build a business and make a lot of money if you want to, and you don't have to work 24 hours a day to do it. Yeah, it's it, you know, I'm I'm come to a conclusion. It's really not that hard to go out and make. I was talking to Patrick today, Patrick Capillari. It's not that hard to go out and make more money. Like, what if you just go around and find something at Walmart that's on discount and sell it on eBay, but first make sure it's selling for more? Mm -hmm. Like, that's that could be $100 right there. Mm -hmm. What if you did that 10 times a day? That's $1,000. Boom, you've already blown your salary from a high-paying company out of the water. But where did that start with? The belief that you can do it. Yeah. And the willingness to mess up along the way. Not all of them are going to sell. You're going to mess up. Hmm. You know? I was just listening to this podcast and they were interviewing a lady who had worked full time at a school and she wanted to be home more with her family. She had like 11 kids or something crazy like that. She wanted to be at home, work yeah. from home. And so she started doing arbitrage where she would go to thrift stores, find things that were selling like on Poshmark or eBay or even Amazon and buy those things and resell them and she treated it like a full-time job. Mm -hmm. She made a plan, she made financial goals, all that. And she left her school job to do this full-time. Once she was home with her kids more, you know, you can inv even involve your family and your children yeah. in this process like we did when we first started out. And well, <laughs> they work for us too, so <laughs> I guess they're still, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, and so like just when you have the motivation and you treat it like a, this is for real, yeah, then watch it start blessing you. Yeah, and here's what I love about it. We just got back, we as in myself and four of our staff members got back from a 10-day trip. We gave away over a hundred over $150,000 worth of gifts. A Tesla, a $1,000 gift card to Amazon, 15,000 to help someone pay for his, his mother-in-law's new home, 15,000 for someone who wants to do snowboarding. Don't forget the $100 Walmart card. <laughs> oh yeah, that was funny. Yeah, that was a joke. But so it, it, and, I'm, and I don't say that so everyone listening is like, oh, look at you. No, I, I wanna share this. There was a day when you and I were driving and I remember we said, if, we, if this goes well, we make a lot of money, we wanna give back. And when I say give back, I wanna be clear what I mean by give back. Give to people who are taking ownership for their lives, not for people who wanna live off of handouts. Remember that day I took our youngest daughter, Adelie, on a date, because I like to date my kids and just hang out and get to know them. And I said, today we're gonna to do something a little different. She's like, what? I said, we're gonna go eat lunch with a homeless guy. You're like, you got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. So no, we're gonna do this. Mm -hmm. And she was not too happy. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't listen to this podcast. And so we went and got the food and we sat down and I'll be honest, this guy is sitting under the bridge. There are brown smears of what it's either, it's gotta be either Nutella or poop. On the bed he's sitting on and the play, it stunk so bad. Like I was literally like trying to protect my sandwich from all the flies and everything. And we sat there and we talked to him. Now, why did we do that? Did we do that because I felt like, oh, I did my good deed for the day. No, I can't stand it when people do that. Oh, give a hand out to someone, but I, do you really care about them? Are you really helping them? And he said something, Kimberly, I'll never forget. He goes, anyone who lives in Austin who is homeless has no right to complain because homeless people got it easy. I sit out here and I get everything I need. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's why I believe in giving to people who want to help themselves. Now, it that was more for my daughter's sake to understand because she's kind of halfway through her growing up years, growing up in a rich family now. I wanted to understand what is it like to be on the in quotes, other side of the bridge. Yeah. Like, what is it like to have nothing? Well, it's, it's healthy for us. I, I, that was more for us than it was for him. But to be able to give to others and help them now, because of the wealth that we've generated, the jobs we're able to provide, we have 37 people total, if you include the Espanol side, employed through just one dime. The properties we're able to rent out and bless people with a great price, but it also helps us to grow our wealth even more. Like, I just, there's so much freedom. And as I say that, I know there are some family members who look at me very skeptically mm -hmm. for the simple fact that I have a lot of money. Yet, did anyone at any point come along and make it easy for me 
Did anyone say, oh, let me give you this opportunity? I mean, I've no. even heard people say. Started from the bottom, now we're here. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Like, we did it. And, and again, I say this with, with gr gratitude. Mm -hmm. Because I know without God, there's no way we would be here. And honestly, but we still took action. It doesn't matter what extended family thinks. God knows your heart. Yeah. You know your heart, and pursue your dreams. Yeah, and and if people listening to this right now, and you get those voices in your head that say you're not good enough, you can't do it, you've messed up too much. I just want you to know truth right now. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. None of that matters. What matters is right now today. You can, you can build margin to do the things you love with the people you love. And the cool part, this isn't the end of the story. Yeah. I don't feel like we've arrived now. I think we're growing, we're learning, some cool stuff is happening, but there is so, I mean, there's so much more I wanna share, but I, I think we should wrap it a, up. I wanna share one powerful quote Please that do. has yeah. been super meaningful to me. I heard it a couple of years ago, and this would be for the significant other who maybe isn't the, the bigger breadwinner or maybe you're introverted and you don't feel like you have a lot of impact um, in the world or <laughs> you know in your circles or whatever. Well, um, this quote was so powerful to my heart and it really gave me perspective. It says, you may not be influencing thousands of people, but you might be influencing the one who's influencing thousands of people. And I don't know who said that quote, but it's something that I just have like internalized and like, you know, that is a tangible thing. Like I can, I have the power and influence to encourage and support a person who's very influential, who's influencing a lot of people. And maybe you're, you know, the person listening to this is in that same boat. Yep. Um, you are impacting people whether you know it or not. 1,000% and yeah. more than we know. More than, when I was at the, the barber today, she's like, thank you, I love talking to you because every time I talk to you, I feel better about my day. I said, well, guess what? Her name is Sassy, I kid you not. I said, <laughs> my joy is coming from these people we gave gifts to who are taking ownership for their lives, like the family who turned their, their a school bus into a, a moving home, sold off their house, now they sell on Amazon, they're visiting the Grand Canyon, right now they're in Nevada, and there's all over the world having fun with their family in a freaking school bus that That's has been turned amazing. into a home. That <laughs> motivates me. So when I get to share that with Sassy and now she's motivated, that's so powerful. Yeah. But I wanna say this, KK, um, thank you for being who you are, and there is no way on God's earth that I could do what I do were it not for you. The people behind, and you're not totally behind the scenes, you have your influencer online, but when it comes to the stuff we were discussing, like the businesses and stuff, mm -hmm. the people behind the curtain are just as important as the people in front of the curtain. It's just a different role. Absolutely. And your worth is not defined by how much money you make, it is defined by how much you are loved. And I hope everyone listening knows that as well. This is I, Seth Kniep, Kniep in It Real, and KK has something else to say. Yes, <laughs> I just want, I wanted to thank you for two things. Yeah. Thank you for dating our kids. I think it's super powerful and more parents need to do that. Um, and secondly, thank you for getting over the fear of asking someone to double your dime. I'm speechless now. You guys have an awesome day. Dakota loves you too. To me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. You watching this? It's like, why are you guys crying? <laughs> we were having such a good time. <laughs> I just shocked him with static electricity. He's like, <laughs> you went back. Are you guys still rolling? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs>